Williams. As always, it's me, Emperor AP, and today I wanted to talk about some key facts about micronations. Before we get into it, real quick, I am going to share the stream so that people can jump in with us. Hey everybody, sorry about that. I appreciate the one person joining us right now. We are just jumping in talking about the key facts about micronations. So um, actually today and over the last few days, I have seen a number of comments, not only on our channel, but on other channels uh, that seem to have, and on people's Instagram posts and stuff like that, that just come out to have some pretty big misunderstandings about what micronations are, about how they operate. So I want to get into that. Uh, uh, Retro, uh, our, our friend Vincent there, our good citizen, says, hello. Hey, Vincent, it's good to see you. Uh, <laughs> Vincent says, wait, I'm a moderator? Yeah, uh, if you have uh, editing access to the channel, you sure are. Uh, so it's good to see you. I appreciate you jumping in and being a moderator for us. Uh, also, thank you for liking. Um, today, I really wanted to talk about some of those key facts about micronations because I think a lot of people who are new to the community can be confused about what micronations are, how they should be striving to do things. I think a lot of the times the projects that we see in micronationalism that shoot for these huge, huge goals and end up falling short a lot of the time are a product of misunderstandings about the way that micronations work, what they should be, what they can be, uh, and ultimately uh, where somebody should try to proceed with them. So. That all being the case, I want to kind of uh, divulge some of that information. I want to inform people a little bit more about micronationalism. And so if you're somebody who's coming in for the first time and saying, I have no clue what a micronation is, uh, this is the video for you. If you have no idea how to get started developing a micronation, this video is for you. Uh, and also, if you are somebody who feels like, oh, I know certainly what micronations are, I've, I've done this for you, this video is also probably for you because you should be learning all the time and growing. I'm learning all the time and growing. And this is a video that I probably needed even as recently as like a year ago. So that being the case, I just wanted to share some of my ideas. First off, one of the biggest things to remember about micronations, and it's right in the name, is that they're small. They are very small, and this is in terms of a lot of is very small. Uh, there is uh, a good amount of support for micronations that you can see for individual nations. For example, there are a good number of people who have heard of at one point or another Malasia. There are a good number of people who have heard of at one point or another uh, Sealand or Liberland or Rose Island, uh, Hutt River, so on and so on. But a lot of the time, if you were to ask people in the general public, if you were to keep talking to them about it, they may have heard of one or two for half a second. They may not remember the name. Uh, for most people, uh, as you get more and more involved in the micronational community, that group becomes a smaller and smaller group. So there are very few people who actually really hardcore know uh, about micronations. It's a small niche. On top of that, micronations themselves are very small. So it's generally a small group of people relatively to a normal nation, of course. Uh, it is very small in its economy most of the time, even ones that start off with fairly large sums of money comparative to other micronations are still very small uh, compared to even like small businesses. Um, on top of that, they are very small in terms of their uh, development. So there are, of course, some nations who, before they even launch, have tons and tons of ideas that they implement. But even still, even if you come in with a decent chunk of money, even if you come in with a decent amount of support, even if you come in with a decent amount of preparation, all relative to being a micronation, ultimately, you still probably have very little actual development underway as you begin. Even the Empire of Eternia, we have a good amount of history behind us. We have five years of history existing uh, and being around on the internet, talking to people. Uh, we have about three years, a little over three years, being on YouTube and developing in this manner that we are with you all. Uh, but we have a very new beginning in terms of developing our territory vitae. Uh, so in all of this, even though we feel like we've been around for a while and we feel like we've been doing a lot, relative to what somebody coming in from outside the community would see, they'd say, oh, this is very small, this is very new, this is uh, something that you're, you're just starting out, right? And I think that leads to a big disconnect between what people in the micronational community who have been developing micronations see versus what people on the outside see. And so I want to clarify that for people, one, who may be just starting nations and feeling like, oh, well, I'm going to just hit the ground running and, and go crazy with it. And also people who are coming into the community saying, why are all these people talking? talking about these different nations and these different groups and these different things when I haven't seen huge news about nations forming and stuff. 
Uh, so I, I do want to talk about that. Uh, Kingdom of Asneria joined us. Good to see you, Kingdom of Asneria. Uh, Asteria. Good to see you, Kingdom of Asteria. Uh, Kingdom of Asteria said, Jadonia was reborn into Great Asteria. Well, it's great to see you. Uh, I was going to say, I remember the flag. Uh, Morgan Mint says, yo, yo, Morgan, thank you for joining us. Uh, oh, no. Uh, Retro said, one of my computer gave me a blue screen of death. I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, is your computer just done? Like, is it completely crashed? Uh, while we're talking about that, I, I do want to get back into the topic. I just, seeing all of this and seeing how small micronations can be and how large people feel like uh, micronations should be, there is this bis big disconnect. So in developing Eternia and in trying to grow it and, and uh, make it something that uh, performs bigger and better every year, one of the most key features that I've noticed of new micronations that are coming in is that they really are trying to shoot for the moon. Um, uh, micronations always come in with big, big ideas. And that's something that's super, super important to growing a nation, developing a nation, uh, and finding out what your interests are in that growth and development. But that being the case, most of the time you have to start with really focused goals. And when you do that, when you're trying to focus on these goals, when you're trying to build up a community, you're probably starting out by yourself or near yourself. You know, you may be with uh, four or five other people, even up to 10, 20 people. Um, even still, that is something that is really up to a core individual or core group of people to control, to regulate, to manage, and to keep growing. So things are going to start out slow. Things are going to be um, trying to progress in a way that is relative to the size of those groups. So um, when you when you see nations starting out and trying to recruit and trying to build for themselves and trying to uh, develop, I think a lot of the time they are thinking in ways that are respect, r respectively connected to uh, large, for example, strategy, MMO, not MMO, strategy, um, you know, uh, in strategy management type of games where you have large, large infrastructures, where you have large development um, and people are able to move lots and lots of pieces independently to be able to grow their goals and interests. Um, I think a lot of people get into micronationalism from games like that, from strategy games, from uh, resource management games, stuff like that, where they will have these large swaths of land and, and money and uh, power and think that that is how they can manage a micronation. That's also why I think a lot of micronations end up leaning more toward the fantasy side because it's a lot easier to uh, develop and control uh, large swaths and groups of things than to try to start realistically in a very small niche uh, and to try and build that independently and to work on growing and developing it. Um, and that's hard. That's hard to do. But it's worthwhile looking at the practicality of micronationalism and the uh, short-term development of micronations simply around that fact. So micronations are small. Uh, that, we can get that out of the way. Micronations are small. When you look at a micronation's development and its size, you should not be trying to compare that to uh, the other nations of the world immediately. You should probably be trying to compare that to other micronations or even to small businesses. Uh, because they can be very, very intertwined in how their economics work, in how their, uh, their social hierarchies work, in how their uh, ultimate advertising and, and marketing management work. And so as you watch a nation grow and develop, you will see these tiny incremental changes, these back steps and these forward steps that help to make it what it is. So micronations are small. The second thing that is really, really important to understand is that micronations being nations are going to have a fairly long uh, quote-unquote gestation period. They're going to have a very long time that it takes them to grow into uh, fully sustainable communities. Now, this is something that very few, if any, micronations fully achieve. And it's something that's quite surprising because if you were to think about a nation, you would say, hey, well, uh, you wouldn't want to... Ooh. Give me just one second. Hmm. Um, so, seeing that, uh, seeing that micronations are um, 
developing very, very incrementally and seeing that uh, very few micronations actually develop into these large scale uh, sustainable communities, you would say, hmm, well, why would somebody declare themselves a nation if they haven't fully built their community? If, you know, they don't have people already on their payroll, if they don't already have, you know, all these government uh, legislative buildings, if they don't already have uh, everything that is required to stand up to what would be considered a large scale nation. And the reason is because a lot of the time micronationalism is about declaring that, is about moving forward with the idea that you can build a nation, that you can create that, that that is something uh, that can be worked on and managed and fulfilled. Um, and a lot of the time what a micronation is and the reason that it's defined as a micronation is because it starts with the individual or that small group. It starts from the concept that I can do this. I separate myself and am creating some unique perspective of myself as in a uh, as in a separate society, as in trying to develop a culture for myself and a uh, connection that is different for, for some reason, for some purpose, than the society that I may have been born into. Uh, and so that is a crucial, crucial detail about micronationalism that I think a lot of people forget, uh, or that people uh, who do remember it don't push hard enough. When we're talking about uh, the the growth of a micronation, when you're talking about advertising your micronation, when you're talking about moving forward uh, with a lot of the ideas and plans that you hope to achieve, a lot of the time we feel like, oh, okay, well, we just need to market, this is a government, we just need to market, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is something that has uh, this and this cool feature but we don't start out enough with the culture. We don't start out enough about what sold you as an individual on why it was that you were so different, why it was that you were developing this, why it was that you became your nation's first citizen. And so I think that's another key fact to remember is that a lot of the time micronationalism starts at the individual level. It starts with a group of people or an individual who are trying to make something different and who initially declare themselves as that micronation. So if micronations are these small scale groups, if they are based around the individual, based around uh, the concept of starting something out, then the growth for a micronation and the purpose for a micronation for a long time, of course, is going to be to convince other people that what they are doing is a nation and what they are doing is, uh, is supportable and sustainable and that they have goals which can be uh, can be laid out in a reasonable fashion to achieve larger growth. That's a hard one. That, you know, the jump between, oh, I'm starting my own nation, look at me, and oh, well, here's all the steps that are required to make a fully fledged developed community are long, are not, you know, a straight and narrow path. It's complex. And it's something that is necessary to talk about as micronationalists because I think a lot of the time people start these nations and they do that first step and they say, I'm a nation, this is what we're doing, these are our ideas, these are our uh, laws, this is, uh, these are all of our different, um, these are all of our different uh, leaders and uh, governmental positions, for example. And then they say, okay, now, now we're done. Now we're, we're good, we're running, we're a fully fledged developed community. And a lot of the time, that uh, causes some conflict or some disconnect between the way that they see themselves and the way that the rest of the world sees them. And so then there's this question of, well, now how do we, how do we continue recruiting? How do we continue growing? Uh, and I think that that stage is where a lot of micronations either fall off or can stagnate because they feel as though, I, I don't understand why we're not growing to, to these very large stages. I don't understand why we're not already seeing an influx of people. We have all of the boxes checked. We have all of the things that are necessary to pull people in. Why aren't we pulling people in? And I think it's that marketing problem. And I think it's this disconnect between fundamentally understanding on both sides, from the micronationalist point of view and from the outsider perspective, what a micronation is. When you can really understand that and when you can talk about these key ideas, it allows you to grow into uh, a marketing campaign and a strategy for understanding who your people are that allows you to easily convey that to others. Uh, first off, I appreciate it. we have four viewers, five likes, 
Thank you very much, Gorth, for joining in. Uh, Gorthian Federation says, hello, AP, sorry I'm late. You're all good. I appreciate you joining in. Uh, let me jump in and, and listen to uh, some of the comments. Retro says, no, it booted up, thankfully, and would you like me to help answer questions in the chat? Yes, please, I would love that. Retro said, what are some facts micronationalists have to face that they don't want to accept initially? Uh, ooh, that's a great question. So some facts that micronationalists have to face that they don't want to accept initially. Uh, real quick, let me move, because I feel like the window light is messing with me. I don't know if it's getting to you guys, but the change in brightness is a little bit surprising to me. And I feel like is is catching me off guard. Let me move this. Maybe it'll give us a little nicer background. I think it'll be a good payoff. I think when that was a lot better. I'm glad he made the move. Still a huge window. Okay. Okay, we're gonna do we're gonna do this, I think. Let me turn this. Let me set up. This right here, and if I can get some backing to it, that would be perfect. We will do maybe some of these, and that should work. Hey, beautiful. Okay, we got it. I'm sitting down and joining you guys in the conversation. Let's see how well this works. Hey, okay, perfect. I think we're good. So, uh, uh, oh, gosh. Until I kick it down. Sorry about that. Uh, yes. So, uh, Vincent asked a great question. What are some facts micronationalists have to face that they don't want to accept initially? I would love to make that into a whole video in and of itself, but to give the short and sweet version, again, I think it's a lot of these key facts. Micronations are small. You're going to start out as an individual or a very small group of people, and you want to grow really quickly but you have to develop those internals first. You have to understand why it is that you're doing what you're doing. What sold you on the need, the necessity to become your own thing, why you feel like you're your own thing. You have a separate culture, a separate identity, a separate governmental system to the nation that you were born into, and maybe to the nation that you're trying to pitch other people to support you over. And that is a really difficult task. To develop that takes a long time, and that's the other part of it, is that micronationalists, I don't think, always want to accept that they're not going to be able to just shoot off and become these overnight successes. There are plenty of examples of micronations that have dot, have become fairly well known in, you know, uh, in history, in, uh, in modern uh, pop culture, for example, Malasia, for example, Sea Land, for example, uh, Rose Island having their own uh, Netflix show uh, or Netflix movie. Those are all examples of communities, you know, even uh, uh, the Contra Republic. Uh, all of these are Hut River. All of these are examples, Atlantium, you know, on Vice. All of these are examples of groups, Liberland. All of these are examples of groups which have had big followings at one point, which have had uh, a large number of people who have supported them, who have had uh, international recognition to some degree or another, uh, and have all, you know, uh, had a decent amount of influx of money because of their status and being well known. I wouldn't say that any of those nations, however, have created communities that would rival any fully accepted nation on earth any macro nation. And you would say, well, oh, that's because, uh, you know, there's no way that a micro nation can have like a standing military. And there's no way that uh, a micro nation can have uh, the same types of uh, economics and all that. First off, I don't think micro nations should have militaries. <coughs> Whole nother topic. But um, it, as for the rest of it, I think that there are a lot of things that micro nations can model after uh, larger nations. But I think there's that misstep, there's that misunderstanding that either one, these groups are not trying to grow into that, which can be a whole thing in and of itself, but for the ones that are, you don't see the connection between where they are and where they need to be in order to get to that point. And that, again, is a long, winding road. That's something that's going to take years and years and years of consistent development and putting all of their funding and effort and resources into that I think... For a lot of people, they end up hitting a certain mark on there, 
and then kind of slowing down and saying, well, I'm good. That's, that's all of my, I really wanted to achieve. Um, and so that's what the, the facts are, in my opinion, that micronations uh, don't want to accept initially, that they're small, that they're not going to be able to grow as quickly as they want to, that making recognition for themselves and getting other people to accept them, become a part of them, uh, or, you know, in some way grow their exposure is all about developing who they are before they just try to market that. It's really hard. It's going to take a lot of trial and error. It's going to take a lot of changes. Um, and I would say just not to give up. It's something that uh, you're continually going to need to find better and better ways to establish for yourself. Also, we have five viewers, five likes. I appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Um, and so those are those are some of the larger things that I think are necessary for us to accept and also necessary for us to understand uh, as, as another one to add to that, macronationalists, people who are from uh, most of the other nations around the world who don't know very much or anything about the micronational community, don't understand what we're doing. They, they may see some of it, but they think either one, with the nations that they have heard of or do know about, if they've ever encountered the micronational community in any way, are probably one of the more popular nations, and they don't take them very seriously. They don't think that that is a full community of nations who are actively trying to grow and develop in that way. They say, oh, this is a one-off individual thing by one person, and that that's kind of it. That happens, I think, in a lot of cases with more popular micronations. And that's something even that is the position of, for example, groups like Sealand. Sealand uh, has gone on record before saying things like, I don't think it, the leaders of Sealand have, have uh, come on record as saying, I don't think every, uh, everyone should have a micronation. Sealand was in a very particular position historically uh, to create a nation and to create a micronation and to do all of these things. And so they're unique and nobody else should really be trying to do that unless they happen to be in such a unique position to declare that. People shouldn't just actively strive for it. And so I think that's what a lot of the macronational community, a lot of the people in other nations view the micronational community as, not as one large uh, conglomerate group of individuals trying to develop their own nations, but as these individual one-off things that occurred as weird uh, side things uh, you know, cliff notes, footnotes in history. And I think that for us to be able to establish our, our nations uh, as a part of that history, and more so to establish our nations with people who may not otherwise know about them and, and care to learn about them, you have to give reasons why, one, you have uh, the value to those people for them to care about you and to learn about you, and as well, uh, to be able to open their eyes and convince them as of why it is necessary for people to pursue those goals, why somebody might want to develop their own society, why it is that someone might feel like it would be more beneficial to join a society that was created more recently, whether uh, as opposed to one that uh, has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. That's a hard sell. That's a hard sell for anyone, and it's going to take constant proving yourself. It's going to take constant development of different assets for you to be able to show someone to say, this is why this works, this is why that's valuable, this is on the scale that it is, and you also have to pitch that reasonably. You can't say, okay, uh, here's what we are and here's our pie in the sky idea. You have to say, these are the resources we have, these are the ways that they work, this is what's been tried and true and tested. These are the things that we've had problems with. These are the ways that we're going to try and fix those problems. And when you are able to approach that at a more reasonable level, someone will start to talk to you about it more reasonably. That's something that's actually been interesting about Tiffany's family uh, that has been developing for myself. Uh, in talking to Jason and Megan, who you all have seen on some of our previous streams, one of our most notable ones recently, uh, explaining micronationalists to normies, uh, explaining micronations to normies. If you haven't seen that one, I recommend you check it out at some point. But in doing that, I was explaining to Megan and Jason, one, what the micronational community is, why it is what it is, and why I as an individual personally would want to develop a nation, and why other people I believe would want to develop their own nations, as opposed to joining the regular political system in the country that they're in. Uh, in particular for the United States, I explained some of those ideas and interests myself, and feeling that there are a lot of people uh, in 
uh, in younger generations uh, who have come of voting age and who have felt apathy, felt, you know, not engaged with the political system, not felt that their vote really mattered, not felt that, you know, they could make large scale sweeping change or that they would have to push back so hard against the system to make large scale sweeping change that they would make very small incremental amounts of change. And so their time may be better invested in other places. And eventually, if you do continue to talk to people about that, it starts to click. It starts to make sense to those people. They start to see reasons and benefits as to why that would happen, so long as you can explain it in a logical manner. And if someone asks you a question and it's difficult and it, uh, you know, has a, you know, a, you can give reasonable, uh, coherent answers to that, it helps to establish a trust and it helps to establish uh, the sincerity of what you're doing. But if you don't have those ideas thought out, if you can't point out the flaws in your own nation and the limitations that you have, especially from a, uh, an outsider's point of view, then you are going to have a very hard time ever selling that to them. Because if you just tell people, oh, don't worry, it'll all just work out, that's not what people invest their time and money in. You have to think that if you're developing a nation in the sense that you hope that your micronation develops into a nation uh, true to form to any other nation on earth, the US, the UK, uh, South Africa, Australia, whatever, France, you have to say, I then understand that people are going to commit their finances, uh, their living situation, their you know, family's future to supporting this. And so I have to make it reasonable and safe for them to do so. And every step of the way, I have to give more assets and more benefits and more security measures to make sure that that's going to be a safe investment for them. And if not, you need to have clear and uh, defined explanations of what those risks are associated as and how you are trying to actively improve those. Um, a lot of micronationalists don't want to touch that side of things. They say, you know, that's not really something we're interested in developing. That's a little too far. Uh, but we still think we're going to become a full-fledged nation. We're going to do all of these things. And they, they want to have that disconnect stay true and uh, between what macronationalists think and what micronationalists think. And you have to bridge that gap in order to get any forward progress. Um, Retro said, welcome, Gore. Uh, thanks for welcoming everybody, Vincent. Uh, Gore says, my ally is getting overthrown by anarchists. I'm not sure how to help. Um, I don't think that's really it. They, we, we have a talk about that as well. Uh, your micronation can't really get overthrown unless you decide to have it overthrown. People can leave, and that's always an option, and it should be. Uh, but if anybody is trying to overthrow somebody else's micronation, really what they're doing is trolling. And you can either ignore them, uh, or you can you know block them and ban them uh, and try to just get them away from your community. Um, Vincent said, uh, what do you think you should do? You can't really fight rebels, so what could you do? Uh, block them and ignore them. Uh, Gore says, I have no idea. Uh, they also live in Scotland and I'm in England. You can block and ignore them. Uh, ooh, Psycholdia says, hi, AP. Hey, it's good to see you, Psycholdia. I'm glad to see you. Uh, she asks, uh, how are you? Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, again, we are talking about the basic key ideas that micronationalists need to understand, that people in general need to understand about micronations. And so uh, Vincent brought up a great question, which I was just responding to, which is why it is, um, why it is uh, that, what it is that some micronationalists need to accept that they may not accept initially. Uh, and that was a great question. Um, hey, Real Novice, thank you so much for following us on Twitter. I would be excited to uh, see see more from you and from your nation. But until then, uh, thank you so much for following us. Retro says, if I'm not wrong, Sealand was trying to make their own nation because the British government wouldn't let them broadcast their news channel, so they wanted to make a nation based on, uh, based so they can do that. Uh, I agree, uh, 100%. Uh, and that's something that's really interesting. Them having this whole run-in with the British government and the British government effectively saying when they kidnapped, you know, uh, German citizens who were trying to invade them effectively uh, and forcing the German government to come and speak to them, they feel like, oh, well, that's unique. You know, because we were so far out of British territory, uh, we had the advantage and the ability to, um, uh, to be situated at a point where we had to bring these na na nations to the, the talking table. You know, uh, they had to sit down with us and treat us in some respects 
as an equal in order to be able to get what they wanted. We kind of forced their hand, and that was a unique position in history, and nobody else really has that. I would say, while I definitely agree that that was a particularly unique point in history, that that was something that uh, gave them, you know, if they weren't in the right place at the right time, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. I don't think that that's impossible to repeat again. Uh, people are able to easily, you know, do things like sea setting, where they create boats, uh, they go out into the middle of the ocean, and they start to develop things. Um, you know, there are plenty of ways as well, just economically, uh, to gain a lot of political power and influence. Uh, this works really well in the United States, where there are corporations, for example, who pay very little or no tax in the United States because of loopholes that they use, uh, because of different regulations they use, and because of political lobbying that they have under their control. And so when you see these different avenues and advantages for groups to just through money, influence, and situation, be able to position themselves uh, in a way to bring governments to the talking table with them. Uh, you have this, uh, this opportunity to be able to grow into some of those situations. That's not something that just has to fall into your lap by chance. That is something that can be systematically designed and built into someone's plan. It's hard, and it's something that uh, is never going to develop without a ton, a ton of effort. Uh, and a ton of concerted effort on people's parts. But regardless of that, it is still really necessary for us to continue to explain that to micronationalists and for us to continue to try and show that to everyone else, that micronations may be small, they may take a long time to develop, they may be uh, something that starts at an individual level, but nonetheless, as long as they identify themselves as nations, as long as they work to make themselves more and more appealing to mass audience, and as long as they try to uh, focus their interests into something that can be small-scale achievable goals uh, for, their, for their size, um, that they can design a certain plan to get there one day. Uh, and that's hard. It's something that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. But eventually, that is something that is necessary for a micronation to do if it wants to pursue those goals. Um, Vincent said, I'm doing all right, Miss Psycholia. Uh, Josh says, what do you think of micronations with no populations but are created as a political statement or experiment? Uh, Josh, I think that's perfectly fine. Um, there are plenty of micronations that develop. Um, again, there, there are some blurred lines between even my own classification for micronations. Uh, some people like to call micronations who aren't developing to become real nations uh, simulationist, for example. Uh, I don't really like that term because it, it implies that it is just like, a, um, uh, just like a game to some extent. I have developed the terms realist versus fantasy nations, which describe nations who are either actively pursuing becoming a real uh, nation, uh, equivalent to other nations in the world, or fantasy nations, um, nations who are doing things and developing things based around their own uh, bubble, their own idea of, well, we can create any infrastructure necessary internally to give the appearance, guidance, and, um, and setup for people to operate as though they were their own uh, their own nation or their own groups of nations or their own, you know, whatever scale they want to be at, their own economies, but that that only exists within this bubble that the micronation has created. That if you were to try and step outside of that and to focus in on what exactly uh, is their relationship with other micronations or what exactly is their relationship with the macronations around them, that the way that they view themselves quickly deteriorates uh, because it does not have any basis in a, a larger connection to the world. And that's, in my definition, the difference between a realist versus fantasy nation. So I would say that those nations, in my opinion, would be categorized as fantasy nations, but that there's nothing wrong with that. That being a fantasy nation doesn't mean you're a fake nation. That doesn't mean that uh, you can't legitimately identify as a nation. You can't go out to people and say, I am, uh, I am a citizen of thus and thus nation, and that we do thus and thus thing. But that your goals, that the goals that you're trying to achieve are not for the purpose of developing a nation that is like every other nation in the world. That that is not something that ever is of your interest. That that's not something that you're pursuing as an end result. Whereas nations that are realist, that is their end result. 
And I would say that there are some fantasy nations, uh, some you know, simulationist nations, some uh, you know, uh, political experiments, whatever you'd like to call them, that do a lot better in what they're trying to do than realist nations. If you compare the effectiveness of realist nations versus fantasy nations, a lot of the time you will find that fantasy nations, for what they are trying to do, do a lot better than realist nations. There are plenty of fantasy nations uh, that even have better coordination, organization, uh, better connection to their community than realist nations do, uh, realist micronations. And that is a tough pill to swallow, I think, for a lot of realist micronations, is that you know, uh, some realist micronations have the express intent to become full-scale nations, uh, you know, and join the UN and become recognized by uh, other world politicians and things like that, but yet operate primarily in a fantasy realm. They, they operate primarily in a way that is not aligned with the goal that they set. And so by that definition, they would be really bad at doing that because all of their efforts are not steering toward a trajectory that would lead them to their ultimate goal. Whereas there are plenty of fantasy nations who are really well understanding what it is that their goals are and are actively pursuing that achievement. You know, uh, there are plenty of nations, for example, who say things like, we're trying to affect local politics, that that's all we're trying to do. We're not even trying to, you know, we're not trying to develop our own communities. We're not trying to have residents. We're not trying to have, you know, permanent populations or anything like that. We are just trying to raise awareness for this particular thing. Uh, for example, a, a lot of micronations, uh, on top of, you know, local politics, a lot of micronations uh, support specific, um, specific causes, for example, climate change, for example, uh, you know, animal rights, things like that, um, nature. All of those things are, uh, or, uh, or uh, you know, specific uh, communities, you know, religious communities, um, ethnic communities, those those groups, uh, or even sometimes historical time periods and stuff like that, all of those groups are well understanding their goals and a lot of the time are going out of their way to achieve those goals and to try and forward progress in what they want to do, and they're very good at it. Uh, so I think that's something that should be really well understood as well, that if you are trying to achieve uh, something as large as becoming recognized around the world as a nation like any other, you have to be able to understand that that's going to be a lifelong endeavor, that that may not happen in your lifetime. It may have to be passed on to the next generation, the next generation, that in order for you to make any hope of yourself or your, you know, your descendants reaching that goal is to take the incremental baby steps necessary to build up to that. Uh, and that's really, really hard as a pill to swallow. Um, uh, Retro says, my way of seeing micronations is a community of people trying to live life on their own terms in a loving family sort of way in some cases. I definitely respect that. And I, I agree to the extent that micronations are uh, trying to develop uh, develop these close communities, trying to develop their own culture and their own identity. Uh, Vincent, I 100% agree with that. I would say, to a larger extent, though, it depends on how your your nation is uh, hoping its end goal uh, results. For Eternia, for example, we are a realist micronation. We are attempting, our end goal is to be recognized as a nation like any other. We are hoping uh, to be able to build to the point that, again, probably not in my lifetime, uh, but in some uh, future generations, uh, that we can be applying to the UN, that we can be uh, working with, uh, you know, not only our own citizens across the world uh, and our own permanent population and residents in our territories, but also to be able to achieve uh, a specific level of econ economic and technological development that encourages and incentivizes macro nations to work with us and to build ties with us and to have official declared uh, connections to us through trade agreements, through, uh, you know, uh, through specific policy measures, through joint action uh, in specific circumstances. Um, those are the things that Eternia strives for. That is the idea that we are pushing for. 
And that's something that's far off. So what we have to say in developing that is that this is going to be something incremental. This is something that is going to take generations more than likely to achieve. Uh, this is something that we are going to have to develop as a, um, as a process which builds from the local community first. This is something that uh, has to pull in a lot of very talented people with great ideas to be able to make into something that can, um, that can achieve what we um, you You can't uh, say uh, a small group of people all of a sudden going to be recognized by the UN given no historical precedent for it. You have to create that historical precedent. You have to define value and reason enough for those nations to say this, this is by all means uh, valuable and, and considered a nation. Even groups like Taiwan uh, with China uh, have an incredibly difficult time uh, re receiving validation as a nation because China is so hard pressed against that happening. Um, Taiwan has a flourishing economy. They have trade deals with many, many other nations around the world. They are recognized by many other nations around the world. They are on many maps and many, uh, you know, connections to other countries as their own country. They have diplomats that go around the world and talk to other world leaders. And yet they are still unable to join the UN because China has such a strong influence over the UN and because uh, of their specific encouragement against groups supporting Taiwan. Um, and so that being the case, this is something that is huge in terms of, uh, in terms of political development, where when you see something like that happen, you know there is a long way to go. When a, a country with hundreds of years of history, uh, a country that, uh, you know, is actively striving for something uh, and has good legitimate claim to it historically, when they struggle to get it in the modern day, you know micronations are going to have a tough time. But that means you have to strive every single day. That means you cannot give up. That means that there have to be specific uh, steps that you are taking in order to achieve that. Um, Retro says, what is Eternia's most recognizable cultural identity? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, if you're talking about our most recognizable, um, uh, our most recognizable cultural trait, I would say that that's, uh, that's a, a quite interesting question. I think for us, it's probably connected to our technological endeavors. Uh, Eternia, as a, uh, as a connection to this community, has always been one that pushes for economy and technology. Um, those two traits are something which is foundational, I believe, to every Eternia. Everybody that I've talked to uh, who is trying to uh, become an Eternian or who has become an Eternian understands that we are trying to develop technologically. We have already done this and tie that to our economy. Uh, we've already done this with our, uh, uh, with our arc furnace. We've already done this uh, with trying to develop our solar power and things like that. That is the way that Eternia feels it can pursue and quickly pursue its independence uh, with respect to the rest of the world. Uh, that doesn't mean secession. That means uh, trying to further the, the notion that Eternia, in other people's eyes, is its own thing. Uh, that allows us, you know, economic freedom. Technology is at the heart of Eternia, and any Eternian will tell you that. This is something that is crucial to our way of life as a people trying to look for methods, whether it's connection through the internet, which has been a core staple of Eternia ever since its beginning, uh, connection to our community and people around the world who consider themselves Eternians uh, through modern means, uh, as well as all the way up to our economic endeavors with the arc furnace, with the solar power, with automation technologies, with my pursuance of uh, a degree uh, in a STEM field and encouragement of others uh, to pursue STEM fields and to uh, pursue uh, connection to these uh, um, these uh, methods for us to achieve our goals. All of our goals are seen through the lens of modern technology, and therefore, our pursuance of those goals 
is fundamentally based on that. And that, that's what I would say is one of Eternia's or potentially its most defining characteristic is that uh, we believe we are justified in our way forward in becoming a, a nation and that we identify as a nation because of our connection to this belief that technology and its, um, and its equalization of people can allow us a step up and an advantage even over those macro nations around us to be able to achieve what we want to. In hyper-focusing on technology, in hyper-focusing on its uh, allowance for us to develop quickly, we can achieve almost anything we want. Um, it's difficult, it's still a long way to go, but from an individual starting out three years ago to now having uh, several citizens, I think 10 or 12 citizens now, who are actively contributing to the Empire of Eternity, who are supporting us in some way every single day, whether it's through our Patreon, whether it is through creating content for us, whether it's being here like you, Vincent, uh, and doing more or less uh, all three, uh, there are people who are actively engaged in advancing that technological effort that attorney is a part of, uh, even through just our Discord, uh, our Discord uh, channels and through that avenue. Our connection to the internet, our influence over the internet, uh, is a way that we utilize modern technology to really, really impact how it is that Eternia can grow. And this is something that's fundamental to us. Tying that into our economics and understanding that economics are the way that we are going to be able to provide value to people, to connect them to our nation, to be able to give them more resources, uh, to be able to work and develop their own talents and skills back into our nation is crucial and it's fundamental to who we are as a people. So that technological aspect, I think, uh, as far as culture, as far as if you were to talk to any attorney and what's the same thing that all of them have in common, it's that belief and support in technology as the way forward for attorney's future. That's fundamental to us. That's in our hearts. That's something that I think is hard to say you're attorney in without. It's, it's necessary. Um, on top of that, of course, are the symbols that attorney has, our flag, our, our name. Um, our arrow of progress, the, the symbol within our flag, all of those harken back to this idea of uh, connection uh, through uh, common beliefs, connection through the idea that uh, there is a, um, a, a group of people who are justified in this, who are the right people for the job, who uh, can achieve despite all odds. That's with the story of Odysseus uh, in the uh, in the uh, arrow of progress. The arrow of progress, uh, if you all don't know, uh, is the symbol in the middle of our flag. It's an arrow going through uh, the eye of an axe head, um, the, where you would place a, a hook for uh, an axe if you were to hang it up. Um, that being the case, it harkens back to the tale of Odysseus, where Odysseus comes back from war uh, and realizes that his uh, country, his kingdom, is being uh, taken over by suitors who are trying to marry his wife, assuming that he is dead. So Odysseus's wife uh, gives a challenge to all the suitors and says, hey, if you can string Odysseus's bow and shoot it through, uh, I think it's 10 or 12 axe heads or something like that, um, uh, through the eye of 10 or 12 axe heads, a uh, small hole for, for hanging them up, that you, can, um, uh, that you can claim the throne. Nobody is even able to string his bow. None of the other suitors are even able to get the first step down. Odysseus sneaks in, disguised, strings the bow easily, shoots through all of the uh, axe heads in one shot, uh, and then uh, reclaims the throne. Ends up killing all of the other suitors, which is a, a separate part of that, but um, that's, that's disconnected to our interests. But that idea that there is a special person for the job, that there is a decision that it takes a really, really concerted effort, that it takes doing the right thing at the right time in the right place to make those conditions occur to achieve that goal, and that it is, in all respects, an incredibly difficult goal, that people try and try and try and they don't get it, and one comes along and does it, we believe we are those people. We believe through the focus on technology, 
and through its ability to allow prosperity economically and socially for our people, that we can be the ones to achieve ascendance into macronationalism, that we can become a nation like all others and earn our seat at the table because we will not stop pursuing it, because we will pursue, pursue with constant focus effort our development of technology. And technology is a place that we can easily compete in. It's still difficult, it's still a long journey, but comparative to almost any other method of trying to gain support and trying to maintain that support, technology is a way that we can truly prosper and truly create a foundation that allows our future generations to keep fighting for that goal. So uh, each of these goals that we have, each of these checkpoints, each of these you know, things that we require in order to, uh, to achieve that ultimate goal is the stringing of the bow. It is the uh, flying through each, uh, the arrow going through each of the individual axes. If it was curved too much, if its path was slightly off, it would have hit one of the axes. It would have uh, stopped in its path somewhere along the way, but it didn't. It went all the way through to the other side. And while this is just a myth, while this is just a tale, uh, it, you know, it's still uh, a tale by Homer. It's still uh, an incredible story and one that uh, I think as a parable to us uh, really connects to this, uh, this metaphor uh, for, or not metaphor, this, uh, this, I guess, mentality for us that we are trying to achieve that we are the people to push through via technology to achieve that goal. Um, that's a great question, uh, Vincent. Josh says, don't want to hijack your live, but would it be possible for you to tell me uh, what you think of my Micronation Princia on MicroWiki? Uh, at another point, absolutely. So we are hoping to do in the future uh, when I can gather some, um, some confirmed hosts for it, some uh, uh, featured judges, that uh, we will be doing a... Um, a micronational shark tank where we want to get a whole bunch of micronations together who uh, want to have their nation and its concept reviewed and they will pitch it to us on a live stream. Uh, these different micronationalists and I will be reviewing those talking about if we didn't have our own micronations and we were just learning about these nations for the first time, would we become citizens of them? Why or why not? What are the benefits? What are the flaws uh, in the plans and how they move forward? Okay, Retro says, so using green energy is a part of our culture. All right, I'd say purple is a part of our culture as well, as you wear a purple shirt as your official outfit. Uh, how I wear purple bandana, uh, that's culture. I 100% agree. Uh, the purple on our flag absolutely represents our culture. I completely agree. Um, that, that purple is a huge part of it. And I think what's actually interesting is my, my current outfit uh, right now, I'm actually wearing a purple shirt. Uh, it's light purple. It's slightly different from our colors. But my outfit actually is a uh, red ascot with a green jacket uh, and uh, no purple on it at all, uh, which is, is interesting. Uh, red is also another one of our colors. It's on our currency. Um, and so that, that red is a part of, you know, uh, the, the spirit, the blood of Eternia, so to speak. Uh, but that purple is absolutely foundation, foundational to who we are. Uh, it's unique. It uh, is distinctive. Not many micronations or many nations across the world uh, use purple as a part of their uh, identification. And so purple really makes us stand out. That, again, is a part of separating ourselves from the crowd, a part of saying we are uh, the, the people to, to achieve this goal. We are unique. Look at us. There is something that is different and distinctive about us. So I 100% agree. And I appreciate you incorporating the purple into your outfit, Vincent. Uh, that is an incredibly big part of who we are. Now, once again, I currently don't have purple connected to uh, our, uh, our culture. Uh, at, at, to my, it is a part of our culture. It isn't a part of my personal outfit for formal affairs but I want it to become more and more a part of that. Uh, actually, in the design for our Microcon outfits, uh, I have incorporated significantly more purple. Um, but that, that's a great thing. And again, I, I appreciate that. One of the things uh, that is another part of the culture that I've been developing personally that I want to show off more and more, if I can do it while well, here, are these. These are leg wraps. These are something that I have done. And actually, if I take my shoe off, I can show you as well. 
uh, these leg wraps connect all the way down as like a sock on my foot. Uh, I wrap them all the way from the bottom of my foot up, uh, all the way up and around my, uh, my pants and connect them. Um, I personally think I'm going to start incorporating, incorporating that more and more into my everyday outfit, again, to be distinctive and unique. Uh, I may end up getting some in purple and wearing them in purple uh, and having that again as another characteristic trait. I would hope that if we can get this to become a large enough and interesting part of our community that we can have everyday citizens, people more and more across the globe wearing these, uh, these leg wraps as again another identifying feature of an attorney. So that if you see somebody walking around with these leg wraps above their pants, that you can guarantee more than likely they're an attorney. Not to say that everybody who wears leg wraps is going to be an attorney, but that that is a defining characteristic of attorneys. Uh, whether they are in full regal outfits or not, that uh, you are going to see uh, them, even in casual wear like I am now, still uh, wearing those leg wraps. It's just a part of who they are as part of their identity and their culture. Um, and so I want to continue to work on that. I want to continue to understand uh, more about the ways that we can identify uh, and connect our culture and, and our purpose to the way that we look to people, to the way that we present ourselves, not only in micronational uh, community situations, but also in everyday life. I think that's a huge part of making ourselves stand out and really pushing that this is serious to us. This is what we want, and this is the way that we, uh, we culturally connect to our people. Uh, and the way that we present ourselves to outsiders. Um, Gorth says, if Eternia did get into the UN, would the territory be the only current land or would it be a larger nation? Uh, that's a great question. So currently, uh, you know, I, I don't see Eternia currently getting into the UN because our territory is connected to the United States. We claim our territory as a part of our influence, a part of what we do, a part of our ability to develop economically uh, and to develop homes for our people. The way that we uh, consider ourselves an independent nation as of the moment is based on the support of our people. So Eternia, in its verbiage, in the, the word Eternia, and I recommend you watch uh, our, our Micronation 101 video, which talks more about this, but the name Eternia uh, is a derivation of two different words. Eternal, meaning everlasting, and ethereal, meaning light or airy like a spirit. And so that ethereal part connects to the idea that when we started out, we had no territory, none whatsoever that I could claim ownership of in any meaningful way. Uh, so the foundation of Eternia was based around that support, that online connection to people, and saying that I myself and any place that I inhabit is considered a part of Eternia, that I as a resident, as a as a citizen of Eternia, represent myself and the land right below my feet, you know, unless you're going to move me and then the step behind me is and so on and so forth, as Eternia. That is Eternia. I am Eternia. And so when there are other people around the world, tens of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people around the world who start to say, I am an Eternia, that is a, a significant amount of land. That is a significant amount of support uh, that is claimed. That doesn't mean that we can go out and start using that land to mine resources and to build buildings and stuff like that. That is where our territories come into play. But that nonetheless is a part of our empire. A huge part of our community are those citizens, whether they are citizens who connect to us via, uh, via Discord, whether that's our citizens that are able to be here in person and work with us uh, on our territory. Those are all still people who go out into their daily lives and say, I'm an attorney, and that has a huge effect. So I think uh, part of our big claim right now, if you know the UN were to knock on my door and say, hey, uh, we heard a little bit about you, give us your, your elevator pitch right now, I would have to say that it starts out with those people, that population around the world who supports us and says that they are attorneys, wherever they are. On top of that, we do have our territory. Our territory is something that was purchased in the state of Alabama in the United States. So uh, we do have to separate culturally and uh, in our identity uh, our territory from the rest of the United States. And we do that by posting signage, by um, you know having this property attached to myself and attached to our LLC, which is uh, the Empire of Attorney in the state of Alabama, and saying that we are using that for residents uh, for citizens to have residence 
uh, and a place to live that is independent and separate. That being the case, though, we still have to pay taxes to the United States on that territory. We still have to operate under U.S. law in that territory. And so that being the case, I don't think that is a particular candidate for, uh, for developing into the U.N. If we were to say that we're seceding in that area, then that would kind of be a more contested ground, I guess you could say, but that is not our interest in any way. We plan to use that territory as a home for our citizens who live in the U.S. and who uh, are uh, can have a place to connect directly to Eternia through uh, their, their uh, living there and working there, um, and as well as a means of establishing further economic ability uh, and to have more place to build buildings, you know, uh, develop industries, to market and sell things to consumers around the world and in the United States locally, in the state of Alabama. That all being the case, we plan to use those territories to buy, uh, to have that one purchased as we have, to purchase more and to continue to expand as a primary driver for, again, retaining permanent residents and for growing our economy. At a certain point, we plan to develop territories that are outside of U.S. jurisdiction and any country's jurisdiction. We plan on pursuing seasteading as one of our future goals. This is a long time in the future. This is something that would require not only con constant maintenance, uh, but constant large-scale support structures on the terms of millions and millions of dollars to be able to even reasonably attempt to build. Not only would these structures cost millions and millions of dollars to build, but the fact that you would have to, for a very long time, and maybe even forever, uh, constantly have boats and helicopters and planes that would be uh, connecting resources back and forth from mainland areas to your uh, effectively floating islands, uh, not to mention the damage that could be caused by natural disasters and things that would constantly have to be repaired. Um, that is our idea for claiming independent territory, where we would say we never seceded from anywhere, we just developed territory that was outside of anyone's jurisdiction. That's our ultimate goal for when we would start to uh, attempt a claim at, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an application for the UN. If we were to start to apply for the UN, we would ideally want uh, setups in that manner, where we already have territories that are agreed upon outside of any other macronation's jurisdiction. That would give us the highest chance of getting approved, I believe, uh, in addition to showing that we have an economy that can sustain that uh, and a permanent population who believes in that cause and who actively identify as attorneys. But having those attorneys first develop their beliefs and their supports through being a uh, citizens of other countries, such as the United States, such as Britain, such as uh, China, such as, uh, you know, uh, France, such as uh, Australia, all of these different countries having individuals who claim themselves as attorneys and having territories of ours around the world connected to these other countries, which have attorneys living in them and working in them and developing independent societies within them, that shows that there is a movement going on. That shows that there is an interconnected nation of people that move beyond one individual geographic boundary. That is what that eternal and ethereal part of Eternia stand for. This connection, uh, more than just geography, this connection via the spirit, this connection via the culture and the interpretation of who we are as Eternia. And as well, this eternal connection that we are going to last forever, that uh, regardless of uh, how much power, influence, uh, or territory we have, that so long as people carry with them in their hearts that they are Eternians, we shall exist indefinitely. And that's the push. That's the push, is to continue to use those resources that we develop in other countries through territories purchased from those countries to expand our influence until the point that we can start to develop territories outside of their jurisdiction. Uh, all of those territories, both territories in their jurisdiction and outside of their jurisdiction, uh, all being connected to uh, this larger Eternian sphere of influence. Tiberius jumped in. Tiberius said, hello, my friend. Hello, Tiberius. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and if you have any questions, please make sure to drop them in the stream. Thank you for liking. Uh, Asterius says, hello, AP. Hello, Asteria. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, Retro says, Tiberius Storm, hi. Uh, Beliga says, hi. Uh, hello, Beliga. Uh, Gore says, hello, Beliga. Um, Beliga says, we use green for our branding as it's slightly unique, though not as unique as purple, of course. I definitely appreciate that, Beliga. And I agree, green is a very unique color. Um, 
Baliga says, we use green to differentiate ourselves from Stalin supporting communist nation. Used to be red, uh, but to show we did not support Stalin, we used green. Makes sense. Uh, Baliga says, I remember when you claimed the land below your feet. Uh, that was a smart idea. Uh, and that's not something that we, you know, reject now. That's still a part of Eternian culture, you know. Uh, it, of course, it's not land that we can use actively, but it is something that can be used by the individuals uh, who claim themselves as Eternians. That is still a part of our culture and our history. That's not something that we've gotten rid of. We don't chalk that down in, okay, how many square kilometers do we have based on uh, how, many, uh, how many feet width uh, of Eternian citizens there are. But that is still an integral part of who we are and a way that Eternians claim themselves as independent and connected to our greater nation. Um, Tiberius says, uh, hello, my friends. Uh, hey, uh, Tiberius, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, again, please, please let us know what you're up to and uh, how you've been doing. Um, it, again, I feel like that, that connection and that uh, setup as a part of who we are as a people is really, really important. And going back to the larger things that people need to understand about micronations is that even the most successful and most consistent micronations are always going to be developing based around that concept, that they are not there yet, but they identify themselves as nations nonetheless, that this is something that uh, is defined by the individual and then that individual seeks to expand to include others' support. Let's see. Uh, Tiberius says, uh, my belief is that the definition of a sovereign state will evolve as low-lying nations succumb to water rise. Uh, I agree with that as well. Tiberius says, micros have a foothold, so to speak. I agree. Uh, I don't think that, I think even just with the advent of the internet, it is harder and harder to d define a nation based on boundaries. Uh, again, it used to be, you know, that uh, if you were within side, uh, if you were inside of the U.S., you were a U.S. citizen. If you were uh, inside of uh, Mexico, you were a Mexican citizen, and so on and so forth, uh, to to certain degrees. And then, uh, as uh, the internet and technology and you know uh, documentation have evolved, uh, we've started to say, well, now you you know there are. Uh, people who travel and they may still retain their citizenship from another country, but they also come to this country and retain uh, new citizenships and things like that. There are dual citizenships. Um, even just community groups through the internet uh, have really, really shown that nations do not have to be defined by geographic borders. And I think that's becoming stronger and stronger and more inherent, especially as we get into space travel, especially as we get into uh, you know, uh, further development of the internet and virtual spaces and things like that um, with VR and augmented reality. I think that line is getting more and more blurred as technology develops as well. Retro says, what if hypothetically someone was born on Eternian land? Would they be a native Eternian or would they be Eternia because their parents are, uh, what's the citizenship status for people born in Eternia? So that's a great question. Um, Eternian citizenship is and always will be something that is, one, defined by the individual. Someone has to say, I want to be an Eternian. If you say you don't want to be an Eternian, then you are not considered an Eternian. Uh, if you do declare yourself an Eternian, then there is one other stipulation. Eternia has to agree that, agree that you're an Eternian. Um, for people who are infants, for example, uh, if if the parents did, the parents can make that determination as to whether they consider uh, their child an Eternian or not, uh, and that is how the government uh, of Eternia will proceed with that. If your parents uh, are good standing Eternians, people who hold active citizenships in Eternia, and their child is born, and their child anywhere in the world. It does not matter if that's on Eternian soil, that does not matter if that's on Chinese soil, that does not matter if that's on Australian soil. If uh, the parents of uh, a child are both Eternians, uh, or even if just the mother is an Eternian and says, my child is an Eternian, then that child, so long as uh, that parent is in good standing with us, uh, is considered an Eternian for our purposes. However, uh, if uh, a child is, for example, born in Eternia 
and their parents have had their citizenship to revoke and are being, for example, removed as, uh, as, um, as citizens. Their child is not considered an attorney. Uh, if their child then grows up and says, I want to become an attorney and I, you know, I have a cultural and historical connection to attorney, I want to be a part of attorney, then they can become a part of that. But attorney and attorney and citizens are uh, a, it is a merit-based award. It is something that you are appointed as in the same way that our government positions are appointed. Uh, I am the one, as of the moment, who determines who is and who isn't an attorney. There isn't something that makes somebody, uh, you know, it, it's not an inalienable right. It is not something that someone can define regardless of anybody else's opinion. It has to be approved by attorney. At any point, anyone who was born in attorney can have their citizenship and their attorney and identity removed by the government. At any point, anyone who has no historical connection to attorney can be appointed an attorney and citizenship and identity. It is a mutual uh, consent agreement between the individual and the attorney and community, and more specifically, the attorney and government. Uh, so that is how that works. Uh, it does not matter whether uh, someone is born on attorney and soil, it matters based on the merit of themselves and before that when they are younger to the point that you know you can't try and require somebody to uphold citizenship uh, requirements, uh, their parents. Their parents must be in good standing in upholding their citizenship requirements. And then if that is the case and their parents approve that they would like their child to be identified as attorney, then they will be. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Tiberius says, I agree. I'm speaking directly to current UN registration requirements as having land. Uh, very cool. Absolutely. Um, and I, I agree. I think that, yes, that will over time become more and more lax. Uh, President, uh, but I still think it'll be weird because uh, nation's political influence, I think, will uh, always take precedent over uh, any, any I, I don't think they'll change the rules very much. I think it'll just be more or less some nations will have to adhere more strongly to those rules. Some nations will have to adhere less strongly to those rules based on the nations that want them in or not. Uh, President Beliga says, cool. Uh, Asteria says, hello, Emperor AP. How much uh, land does Eternia own? As of right now, uh, it is 3.5 acres. Uh, that's a great question, Asteria. Uh, Vincent got it very close and essentially correct. Three acres, it's 3.5 acres. Uh, again, one of the things we have to do as soon as possibly can, but it's actually a few things down our list as of the moment, uh, is to get a land survey. That land survey is probably going to cost us around $2,000 or so. Uh, so we have a few things that we need to achieve before then, uh, one of which is most, uh, most recently and most uh, frequently, uh, we need to, uh, most quickly, we need to gain uh, some chert, uh, some gravel for us to be able to create a, uh, a driveway for ourselves to be able to park larger vehicles on the land and to keep them there permanently, as well as and to increase access to the land for multiple vehicles, uh, as well as getting a culvert uh, to be able to extend that driveway out to the road uh, and to make sure that that is uh, meeting all legal requirements from our local county. Uh, but yes, three acres is three and a half acres is, is the uh, correct amount. Uh, Retro says two grand. Yes. Uh, once you start purchasing land, uh, you realize that uh, unless it has everything pre-developed, for example, there are plenty of uh, pieces of land that you can develop that already have driveways, that already have, uh, you know, uh, their water lines established, their electrical lines established, their uh, septic tanks established, uh, or sewer uh, lines established, um, that you can buy that are pretty much fully, fully, fully developed uh, homes. However, the land that Eternia purchased is completely undeveloped, which means there is no driveway, there are no, uh, in fact, there are no water lines to a city whatsoever. There is no infrastructure developed out there at all. We can get electrical from an electric company that is nearby. We can have electrical lines run out there. And in fact, there are electrical lines on the road that we're on, so we're safe there. But as far as connecting a driveway, we have to build that driveway ourselves. That's going to cost probably somewhere close to eight, nine hundred dollars for both the gravel that we need laid out as well as the uh, culvert that we have to purchase to connect it to the road. Um, in addition, 
uh, developing uh, the well that we have to have dug because there are no uh, infrastructure, you know, county or city water lines developed. We have to have a well dug, which means that we our water system will be completely off grid. It will be completely based on the water table that we uh, have access to on our land that we're pulling water directly out of the ground and using for our own resources. The good news about that is that means no one can shut our water off. We're not paying a water bill. We directly own all of the water as it is attached to the land and the naturally flowing underground uh, uh, water table connected to our land. Um, and then of course we will have to develop a septic system because again there's no water system so there is no sewer system and so we have to develop a septic tank we'll have a drainage field uh those two things if you're if you're surprised by two grand for the uh uh for the uh land survey uh where somebody's just going around and telling us this is the defined boundary of your land so that we can start to put up fencing and uh, other materials uh to to define that and also to keep people out um the and, and animals the um the other costs will surprise you um installing that well uh will probably be anywhere from like five six thousand dollars all the way up to twelve thirteen thousand dollars um the septic system will probably be in the range from you know seven eight thousand dollars to you know eighteen thousand dollars maybe uh this is going to be incredible large incredibly large amounts of money However, once we have a water system and a sewer system established, uh, water system and a septic uh, tank established, once we have electrical lines and everything established there, uh, that land increases in value nearly exponentially. You know, that becomes uh, probably like a $100,000 piece of land, a $200,000 piece of land, um, just because there was no infrastructure there and now it's fully equipped and ready for any house that anyone wants to build at any time. Um, so it's a, a nice investment. Um, Kingdom of Greatest Area says, how does one create a legal currency? That is a great question. We actually have a previous video that I would refer you to talking about a money transmitter's license. If you look up uh, money transmitter's license, if you look up, you know, Eternia, Micronation Currency, money transmitter's license, something like that, you should see our video pop up. Uh, you require a money transmitter's license. Most nations all around the world require that if you want to create a medium of value exchange, I believe is how it's termed in U.S. law, uh, or at least in Alabama law, um, you have to purchase a money transmitter's license. That's to protect people who invest in things like Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, um, or even just local currencies from having their money stolen. Uh, if you've ever heard of pump and dump schemes, uh, there are plenty of cryptocurrencies that went out and told everybody, this currency is going to the moon, buy this currency, buy this currency, it's going to increase in value the more that people invest in it. And people bought a whole bunch of it, spent thousands or millions of dollars on it. And then the people who created that currency dropped its value to zero and cashed out everyone's investments such that they became wealthy on all of those, those coins uh, and left everybody else penniless, losing all of their investment money. Um, that's something that has happened very, very frequently. And so in order to combat that, uh, many years ago, uh, money transmission licenses were, uh, money transmission laws were developed all around the world, such that in order to create a currency, you don't necessarily have to be a full-fledged bank, but you do have to have what is called a money transmitter's license. That money transmitter's license, uh, it, the fees in order to develop and set one up can be as small as, you know, five, six hundred dollars all the way up to, you know, a couple thousand dollars or so. Um, and that's to establish yourself as a money transmission business, which has the ability to trade currencies. So uh, that means that one, you can create your own currency. You can say, uh, for example, I want to take uh, US to do, uh, as well as you can trade crypto legally at that point. Uh, and be a, you know, a brokerage for that. You can actually be the source that people trade through. Uh, you can also trade international currencies with that license. So you can say, I'm going to uh, take uh, yen and trade them for US dollars or uh, for Mexican pesos and so on and so forth. Um, that is something that is uh, really a large scale goal for Eternia. And that's something that you should uh, look into as well. Um, of course, you can develop your own currency, so to speak. Uh, for example, we have the Imperial note that is actively for sale on our uh, Etsy shop on the Imperial market. 
uh, which you can go and check out and purchase. But as of the time being, that's just an investment in who we are. That is something that uh, is a um, a means of supporting us that, you know, you can get yourself on the aristocrat board as shown as being one of the most wealthy attorneys, having the most attorney and currency uh, for doing so. Uh, and it helps us to be an investment, to use the capital that you spend on those notes uh, as a method of developing future projects. However, you cannot get that, you cannot exchange that back for U.S. dollars. Uh, that's not something that we can do for you. Uh, because that would be money transmission, and that would be something that we require a license for. However, the second that we do get that money transmitter's license, we can start to do that. We can start to uh, create that um, that uh, medium of exchange. So that's our, our future plan, uh, and I recommend that as well. Nate says you can make private currency. Agreed, you just have to do so legally. Uh, through a money transmitter's license. And that's not just something for the U.S., that is for the U.K., that is for the European Union, that is for Australia, that is for, I believe, many Asian countries. Uh, Japan has, I believe, uh, those laws set up many African countries. Most countries around the world have money transmission laws, so I would look into those. Retro says, uh, Vincent says, So, AP, I have a question. Will you be putting up a border fence post and thing uh, that says, uh, like, welcome to Eternia, like Malasia does, to show his border between Malasia and the USA? Absolutely. Um, I think ours will probably be <clears throat> a little more Eternian than that. Uh, but yes, 100%. So we will probably be putting up uh, a fence around Eternia. Um, ideally, um, something connected with a lot of greenery. So... You know, not only having the fence itself, uh, whether I, I would think more than likely like a metal fence, uh, not like a chain link fence, but like a metal, you know, like m metal steel bars um, that would go uh, all the way around the property. And then from there, having lots of shrubbery and bushes and things like that that would actually cover the view around the property so that people can't see in. Uh, and then we would have, of course, a big gate. Uh, that would welcome people into Eternia, maybe having an archway that says something like Eternia or Welcome to Eternia. Uh, of course, we would like to develop road signs and things like that to lead people onto our property and to show them where the, the driveway entrance is, uh, but that would be something that is uh, fairly reserved. We, of course, will want tourism. We, of course, will want people to come and check out our nation and see what we're up to, uh, but that will be on a, you know, uh, a pre-selected visitor basis. Uh, we will have to approve people to actually come onto the property and to learn about us and to document us and to work with us. Because other than that, we will be developing our industries. We will be, you know, developing people's residency there. So people actually living and working there as a part of their full life. So uh, we don't want to make that something that uh, feels uh, too intrusive, where we have, you know, lots and lots of people just coming in and, and kind of invading into our residents' lives. We, we want to make sure that that's kept limited and uh, that uh, people are made well aware that, you know, this is, uh, th this is when tourism will occur. These are, you know, the locations that tourists will be able to visit. You know, these are the places that they won't be able to visit um, uh, so that we can operate our day-to-day -day lives and our uh, industries around that tourism. So that's a great question. Tiberius says we planted a flag on each of our properties but removed them over time. We use one for our home, one for our income, uh, and one as undetermined yet. But it's a wooded development, uh, but it's wooded in a homes only HOA development. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about that. That's rough. Uh, I hate homeowners associations. Uh, they, it's ironic. Homeowners associations act very similarly to uh, micronational governments in the fact that they want to control everything. Uh, but they don't necessarily have their uh, homeowners' best interests at heart. They are trying to uh, increase property value as much as possible and maintain uniformity in their, in their uh, division, subdivisions. So essentially a homeowners association will more than likely be a group that's either made up of people in the area who have bought up and owned and control so much property or people who will um, uh, who started out as having bought uh, all of the property and then subdividing it. So, for example, uh, if somebody buys 100 acres of land and then creates that into uh, and starts selling properties off, you know, subdivision lots for houses uh, to be built and made uh, on that property, 
they could sell you it and in the contract say, but you have to agree to these uh, homeowners association bylaws, which state this is the type of house you have to build. These are certain rules you have to maintain and regulate and so on and so forth, um, which can be very difficult. Nate says, AfriCrypt is the biggest crypto uh, scam ever. Absolute tragedy. Absolutely. And that's why money transmitters laws are so important and have come to become uh, the gold standard for, uh, you know, valuing whether or not a currency is legit or not. Uh, the great Asteria says, uh, Ho, how are things going between Attorney and Stemeria? I've seen Stemeria's condemnation video. Um, they're not going at all. Uh, you know, how are things going? We, we don't speak to each other. Uh, at Stemeria condemned us. Uh, we're still not 100% uh, uh, sure why exactly. Um, we have done everything that we can to abide by our agreement. Uh, and so we're just allowing that to happen. Uh, they've condemned us. Uh, I'm sorry that they've condemned us. That sucks for them. Uh, but we're continuing to move on. Uh, we're still going to uphold our agreement uh, and do it in the time that we establish. And we'll move forward from there. Uh, it seems that uh, Stemeria wants nothing to do with us. Uh, and at this point, because of their condemnation, I don't think uh, we want any future business with them as well. So uh, just that's what happened. Uh, they, they, you know, decided to badmouth us. And now we're continuing forward. Tiberius says cryptos are likely to go belly up if we enter into a full recession. Um, I, I agree a lot of them are. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I still think cryptos will be around for a very long time. Letro says, um, touchy subject, I'd say, but it's up to AP if he wants to talk about it. Um, I don't think it's a touchy subject at all. If you're talking about Stemeria, I don't think it's a touchy subject at all. Again, they condemned us. Uh, I feel insulted by that. I'm not sure uh, fully why they decided to do that. Uh, but they decided to do that, and I think it was wrong on their part. Um, we're moving forward. Nate says, uh, they probably ended all relations, let's end the discussion there. Uh, agreed. Uh, Tiberius says, the U.S. at least doesn't have uh, monetary notes tied to gold. Nixon did away with that in 71 question mark or something like that. Non-gold tied currencies will suffer. Uh, I disagree. Uh, I don't believe, you know, fiat currencies are the future. They are the maintained standard for uh, currencies, and there is no reason to have a, a currency backed by anything. Uh, fiat currencies uh, are the modern understanding of economics and the way that uh, societies move forward, uh, especially when scarcity of resources changes the value of monetary systems so dramatically. People's work, their efforts, and the gov governments that subsidize those efforts are ultimately the true sources of value for any currency, not something that the currency is backed on, like gold or silver or whatever. That's ridiculous. Uh, Tiberius says, uh, greatest area, attorney is strong and still moving ahead. Thank you, Tiberius. That means a lot. Tiberius says, you are absolutely correct about HOAs. Property is essentially investment, but I, uh, I'd like to do something on it while I hold it. Makes sense. Francisco says, AP, we won. Uh, congratulations. I, I still am confused about your conflict, and I, I don't know that anybody really won. Um, uh, Vincent says, I don't listen to HOAs personally. I tell them to pound sand. Uh, that makes sense. But at the same time, if you purchase the property on an HOA, uh, you know, development and you signed a contract that says that you will agree to their things, they can take you to court over it. Like, if, if you're in a position where a homeowners association has control over your property, there's not really too much you can tell them, oh, pound sand. Like, like I don't have to listen to you because... They, they can, you know, depending on how strict your contract is, uh, they can take you to court over it and you can uh, be forced uh, significant fines over that and consistent significant fines over that. So uh, I, if you're in a position where you uh, are forced into an HOA agreement, first off, if you don't like HOAs, don't sign, don't, don't sign the agreement, don't move on to that property. Um, but if you're in a position where you already have, you probably just have to listen to it, unfortunately. Um, um, Asteria says, well, my parents rent a house, so we don't own the house, so we haven't signed anything. Agreed. Uh, and of course, you may not, it, then that's interesting, because what probably happened is your family is renting it from the person who owns the house. The person who owns the house probably purchased the house from the group who has the homeowners association. 
So if the homeowners association comes and puts something on your door, which says, hey, you're not abiding by homeowners association policies, you have to start abiding by those, and your family says, we don't care who drops, all the homeowners association has to do is go to the person who owns the property and say, hey, uh, your subletters, the people who are renting from you, uh, are not abiding by our homeowners association policies. So you're right, we can't sue them because they didn't sign a contract with us, they signed a contract with you. We're gonna sue the owner and we're going to collect those fees from the owner. And at that point, the owner would probably either one, try to evict your family, which would suck, or two, would pass all of those fees down onto you. Uh, your family may have signed a contract with the renter, uh, with the uh, person who owns your home, who you're renting it from, that says something equivalent to, we will agree to all of these homeowners association bylaws. If you didn't, then agree, that's a stronger case for you, uh, but that person still may have a clause in their thing that says, uh, if any, if any uh, fees are established, that those fees are going to be paid by you, or they could have established something equivalent to, uh, well, uh, at any time we can cancel this rental agreement and, you know, uh, move to evict, which uh, they may end up using their handle. So uh, that's not good. I certainly wouldn't recommend it, uh, and I hope that doesn't happen to your family. But if the, either your family directly or the owner of the, the property uh, has agreed to homeowners association bylaws uh, in, a, in a contract that they did to purchase the property, somebody's subject to that, and eventually it, it will come down the line. Um, Francisco says, uh, Rhodesian dollar is pegged to Kuwaiti dollar at a rate of one to one. Very cool. Uh, that's the same thing with the US dollar and the uh, Eternian note, the imperial note. Uh, our imperial note is uh, pegged one to one to the US dollar such that it costs one US dollar to purchase one imperial note minus uh, taxes and uh, shipping costs to send them to. Um, Great Asteria says, uh, the Kingdom of Great Asteria just opened the Arena Tournament Battles. Uh, we are accepting all my conditions. Very cool. Tiberius said, I need to go. Uh, bye, everyone. Be well, everyone. Uh, AP, I'll talk with you soon. I appreciate the comment and content and comments. It was good to see you, Tiberius, and I can't wait for our next conversation. Uh, Nate says, congrats, Fran uh, Franco. Viva Cristo Rey. Uh, Ooh, Retro says, AP, it's sounding very windy. Yes, uh, we're receiving a lot of rain right now. I'll see if I can't move in. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Uh, Nate says, AP should buy a mic for his phone. Retro, uh, shall we start a fundraiser? Uh, and Francisco says, thank you very much. And then Nate says, JK. I appreciate it, guys. I am going to try and speak a little bit closer to the mic so you guys can hear me. And I will start to move in side because uh, this is uh, getting worse and worse and at very least I'm gonna get significantly wet so I might as well start the process of moving in now let's see what we can do da, 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 da. Uh, but I hope everybody is well and I'm excited that you guys are joining me in the stream um, again I feel like learning about the things that micronations need to understand about themselves and also about uh, Oh, geez, uh, the pool is almost entirely flooded. This is crazy. Okay, we're rushing in. Ready? Three, two, one, and we're going. We're going. I'm going to have to run around the front because I don't think anybody unlocked the back door. Running, 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 still running, continuously running. Ugh. All right, and we're back. Hey, nigga. What's up? Okay. So we're back. Headed into the back so I can talk to you guys. I hope this sounds a little bit better. It's certainly a lot quieter. Um, let me see if I can't set up and we will continue the conversation. I'll move, let me move here. Do, 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 do. But yes, um, I feel like learning about what it is 
that is most important to micronations and how micronations develop themselves uh, is definitely key to micronations growing and developing. Uh, it's it's hard. It's something that, once again, it takes a lot, a lot of effort to perfect and to learn more about. But nonetheless, is necessary for us to discuss. Because the more we can discuss it, the better we can grow. Uh, Nate says retro and during the rain in a few hours. Uh, Nate says now it's too quiet. Nate, Nate, you get you can complain no matter what. We we had to pick one, and this is what we're doing. Um, ooh, uh, it's multiple questions. So let me get a chair. Let me get a chair right there. Okay. People asking multiple questions out here. Uh, Vincent said, no, it's a lot better. Thank you, Vincent. Um, Asterius says, micronations does Eternia recognize? That's a great question. The first answer that I will give with that is saying uh, we have a, um, uh, this is a an important uh distinction. So we have a number of nations that we actively work with and are developing ties to, um, you know, nations that we are hoping to eventually establish alliances with or something similar. Uh, and those are nations that we work more closely with. I can name off a few of those. But for recognition, uh, we really don't have like official declarations of recognition or, or, uh, or uh, foreign relations or, uh, you know, a lot of the different uh, declarations that micronations come out with. A lot of micronations will say, you know, we have entered into foreign relations with so-and-so country. Uh, we have created a declaration of friendship or a declaration of mutual recognition with, with this and this micronation. We don't really do that. Um, Eternia recognizes any micronation that calls themselves a micronation. Uh, it's not that, you know, if, if, a, if someone comes to us and says, we're a nation, we don't say, no, you're not, because we don't recognize you as a nation. You're not a nation. That, that's ridiculous. Um, at that point, anyone can point fingers at anyone and say, you're not a nation. So instead of doing that, Eternia recognizes any nation that recognizes themselves. Now, does that mean that we're going to work with every single micronation? Does that mean that we consider ourselves friends or allies with every single micronation? Of course not. Uh, but that is different. You know, uh, you can pursue your own goals and we can recognize you as a nation simply by you saying we're a nation and this is what we're doing. Uh, that's just us saying, OK, we, we understand what you're saying. Um, however, there are very strict requ requirements that Eternia has for the nations that it actually works with. Uh, and that's something that's entirely different. Right. We want to establish um, specifically uh, economic means uh, of mutual benefit between ourselves and other nations. So whenever we start to establish connections to other nations, a lot of the time the thing that we're talking about is, well, what are some things that Eternia can provide to your nation and that your nation can provide to Eternia that would give mutual benefit? And that's hard. That's not something that uh, is uh, easily established or developed most of the time. And so as we continue forward and as we start learning more and more about uh, that nation, we have to try to figure out what those potential deals can be. And of course, a lot of the time that can connect to uh, just our establishment of creating content on the internet. Sometimes that, you know, if a nation is local enough to us, transporting goods or, or creating services, working with each other, it just all depends on the location and the abilities that each nation has. Um, Retro says, what micronations recognize Eternia? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I, again, know that there are a number of nations that we are actively working with uh, that I, I think support us. There are also a lot of nations in our Discord who know of us, so I imagine to some extent or another they recognize us. But again, because Eternia doesn't enter into mutual treaties of recognition and stuff like that, I wouldn't have a good count on that. Uh, and I would say to us that's really not so important. Uh, we're out here broadcasting what we're doing and trying to explain to people what we are and what we're doing. And so uh, it, we don't really seek recognition from other nations. We tell you we're a nation. We tell you this is what we're doing. And if we have some way uh, that we can benefit each other, then we will move into uh, a more um, official declaration of, of uh, 
of development, being, you know, working with each other through an alliance uh, or some sort of uh, trade deal. Uh, so that, that's something that we pursue actively, but isn't something that we're necessarily concerned about getting official recognition for uh, by anyone. Nate says, uh, Gorth is king of micronational TikTok. Sorry, AP. Uh, that's all right. Uh, that's all right. Uh, Gorth has been killing it. Uh, I'm really impressed by Gorth, and I want to learn a lot about what they've been doing on TikTok. Uh, although I think their goals are significantly different than ours, so I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, Nate says, Uno reverse. Uh, Retro says, yes. Uh, uh, Retro says, that's a lot of sticks albums. Uh, it sure is. Uh, Tiffany's family is... Uh, uh, big fans. I, not only of that, there's a lot of like just rock albums in general all over this wall. Uh, it just so happens that there are uh, multiple sticks albums in the place that I'm sitting right now. Uh, but that's a great, uh, uh, great topic. Uh, Francisco says, uh, "What are your thoughts about Saddam Hussein?" Uh, I do not like Saddam Hussein. Um, uh, I think uh, with the you know. Um, uh, with the Arab Spring and with the uh, the downfall of dictators like Saddam Hussein, uh, hopefully uh, the uh, the Middle East can transition into uh, other uh, more representative forms of government, uh, specifically uh, in uh, in Syria. But I think that uh, was Saddam Hussein in Syria. I, I feel like I'm goofing this. Saddam Hussein was not in Syria, right? Hold up. Oh gosh, I'm I'm goofing this so hard. You guys are asking me about a dictator that fell in like. The mid two thousands, like ah, y'all know I don't keep up with history. Uh, y'all are y'all are goofing me. Uh, but uh, Saddam Hussein was a dictator. Uh, from everything that I have read and understood about him, um, I, I do not support him. But I should I should stop trying to you know overexert my my understanding of it uh, beyond what I actually know. Uh, Nate says. Uh, can we just give an applause to AP for the past month or two, how many haircuts he's had? I appreciate it. Uh, it's always been the same haircut, actually. Uh, like, it was one haircut that you guys all started, like, making comments about, and now it's just, like, how it forms throughout the day. Like, I've just started messing with it and stuff. Uh, you know, I sometimes I put gel in it and slick it back, but it's not like it's different haircuts. It's, it's the same haircut. Uh, Francisco says, on one side, I like him because of his anti-communist stance. On the other side, I hate him because of his anti-Semitism. Uh, agreed. The anti-Semitism is bad. I also don't like people who are anti-communist. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, communist nations are, are what they are. Um, authoritarian nations are bad. And there are plenty of com communist nations who have developed into authoritarian nations, but communism in and of itself is not bad. Uh, Retro says, Saddam was in Iraq. Thank you, Vincent. I appreciate it. I I knew as soon as I said Syria, I was like, I goofed. That That is not where he was. I, I thought it was either Iraq or Iran. It was Iraq. I appreciate it. Uh, Francisco says, I also like him because of his mustache. Interesting. I interesting love of dictators via, via facial hair. Francisco says, uh, Nate says, Francisco comes in with the controversial questions. Agreed. He talked about Saddam Hussein last time, though, which I... Uh, I still don't know. Uh, Retro said 1991 was when he taken out. Even further, even further back. I knew it. I knew it was a while back, uh, but I, I'm, I don't have any of these dates. So that's why I was like, I should stop overreaching. You know, I, I don't know enough about it to, to keep hitting on it. Uh, so, uh, Francisco says Saddam was president of Iraq. Thank you. Drew says, hello. Oh, Retro is now a mod. Cool. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, because he is one, our citizen, and two, someone who uh, is actively creating content for us, uh, which we really appreciate. So um, he is a mod and has uh, certain benefits on the channel because of that, and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, Nate says, sub, Drew. Uh, Retro says, yes, I'm a moderator. Uh, absolutely. And again, we're, we're looking for more people to help us create content. We're looking for uh, more ways to continue to further the progress that Eternia has made. So uh, in the future, you know, as, as Eternia continues to uh, push forward through its goals and trying to achieve those 4,000 watch time hours they're trying to hit up, which we're actively trying to do right now, uh, you all can talk to me about that and, uh, you know, what your interests are. Again, I need to get back to Matt uh, about his uh, business and about your business. I believe you're connected to it, Drew. Um, and I, I want to, to start expanding that as well and discussing that a little bit further. 
my biggest interests have been trying to understand a little bit how that can mesh with our current goals. And I think that's a little bit of a, a struggle for me, but uh, I'm absolutely happy to continue discussing that. Uh, Francisco says, it was in 2003 when the U.S. invaded Iraq. Thank you. Nate says, well, uh, having his username being Franco. Yeah, that's true. Uh, with the, with the you know, dictators. Retro says, I mean, we are old uh, AP, but we weren't around that long, so I don't blame you for not remembering. I appreciate it. Yeah, yep. Uh, the 20s, in, you know, I'm, I'm 24 about, uh, and so I'm... Uh, I'm getting up there, but yeah, I, I do not, um, I don't have an active recollection of the fall of Saddam Hussein. Uh, I heard about it and learned very little, uh, but I, I really, it's not a topic that I know enough about to extend upon. Other than that, I know he was a brutal dictator, uh, an authoritarian, and was somebody who, uh, like you said, was uh, anti-Semitic, so uh, not, not supporting that at all. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate everybody joining us. I know that uh, the conversation got a little bit off topic, but I really do want to stress that discussing what a nation is, what a micronation has to offer, and what the current state of affairs is, is really, really important because it teaches others outside of the community what it is that we have to offer and what it is that we actually are. There is a huge disconnect between what the micronational community thinks micronations are and how individual micronations view themselves versus what the rest of the world thinks of micronationalism and how we are identified. In some respects, that shouldn't matter at all. You should develop your nation regardless of what anybody thinks of it. That being the case, though, for people who are trying to grow their nation larger, for people who are trying to seek more, uh, more extensive forms of recognition from the outside community, that 100% should be something that is uh, viewed and understood as a, a necessity, uh, trying to bridge that gap between what other people think of the community and of your nation versus what you do. Um, Retro says, we briefly went into school in wars of the, we briefly, we went briefly in school in wars of the 20th century class and U.S. history. Hey, very cool. Um, well, I, I certainly appreciate that. I, I appreciate everybody's commentary and takes on specifically uh, the micronational topic that we've been talking about today um, and just asking those questions about, you know, what it is that a micronation is, what it is that Eternia uh, is and what its kind of uh, cultural and historical connections are, uh, why we're doing what we're doing, how to develop currencies, things like that. All of these ultimately are questions which micronations have to answer for themselves, but I think also mirror the larger questions about what micronations are to the outside community. Uh, Vincent said, oh, I thought of a question. Uh, so how do you think geopolitical situations going on right now could affect future micronations being made or formed out of discontent of the world situation? I think our community is actively growing. I think there are a lot of people who are very upset with the way that the world is headed. And I think that on an individual scale, you know, whether it's the war in Ukraine, whether it is uh, increased prices for things like gas, uh, economic downturns all over the world, um, whether that's, uh, you know, uh, political instability in their own country, whatever it may be, people are upset and people are looking for a way to develop something better than what they had previously and what they're actively living in. So there are plenty of cases around the world, including in the United States, where people are very supportive of the idea of new countries being developed and of new opportunities for themselves and their families. So I think that right now these political situations that are developing are prime uh, candidates for breeding people who, uh, who are uh, active micronationalists, uh, people who not only know about micronationalism, but are actively attempting to either join a micronation or to create one themselves. That's, I think, for a lot of people, something that's a strange idea. Again, we're still a fairly niche community, but the more that people learn about us and the more that we continue to develop, the more opportunity we have to show people what it is that makes us unique and different and the way that we can specifically go about achieving not only those goals that, uh, uh, that help to push us in the direction that we want to, but also the way that our community is understood externally 
you know, the more people that come into this community, the more chances there are for, uh, the, for large scale growth, for people to really, really influence externally uh, from our community what it is that people think of us. Uh, but there is a risk to that as well. There is an increased uh, worry that more donations coming in also mean more crazy people, uh, more people who are creating micronations for the wrong reasons, more people who are creating micronations that are become, going to become more and more popular, that become more and more controversial. And that can be a huge problem when it comes to protecting the reputation of our community, because if our community starts to become known as a place uh, that is problematic, a place that is harmful for people, um, then we have a an even harder uphill battle to fight, not only trying to declare ourselves as micronations and teach people what micronations are, but go against the ne negative stereotypes that develop around micronationalism. And so it's really, really important that we understand that and try to go about marketing ourselves and developing in the right way so as to present, prevent further backlash or backstepping, backpedaling for ourselves and the community at whole that we're a part of. Retro says, as long as I've been alive, I've been around for the Iraq War, but so are most people born uh, before 2021 or 2022 when every uh, of the U.S. pulled out. I thought it was ended in 2012 when Obama was pulling out troops. Uh, yep, uh, we're, the U.S. is in a lot of wars. Uh, actively, like, the U.S. has troops in a lot of different places, even if they don't call them individual wars. Uh, a lot, a lot of places. Um, Francisco says, in Serbia, bread was 32 dinars um, or 30 cents. Now, two months later, bread costs 52 dinars or 50 cents. Uh, that's, that's a big jump. Uh, Joseph said, my nation has been building itself online, mainly on Discord. Very cool. Uh, congratulations, Joseph. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Retro says, at least food seems somewhat affordable. Food is getting more and more expensive in the U.S., so is all of other things. Agreed. And that's, again, because of rising gas prices. Uh, one of the biggest issues in the U.S. Uh, is uh, rising gas prices. And rising gas prices, as we talked about uh, in a previous stream, connect to the transportation industry in the U.S., which the trucking industry is the main way that we get uh, all of our resources and supplies uh, all across the country. So when the price of gas goes up, the price of transportation and shipping goes up. Price of transportation and shipping going up means uh, the price point of individual items at stores goes up, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, which means you may pay, you know, five, ten percent higher uh, for all of your groceries than you had previously, or even more. Um, Francisco says a minimal wage is twenty-five thousand dinars or two hundred thirty dollars. Uh, um, that's uh, uh, or two hundred thirty dollars a month. Uh, makes sense. Um, that's uh, that's significantly lower than the U.S. But I think what's interesting is. Um, I, I don't know enough about Serbia. I would I'd be curious to learn more, but uh, I know in the U.S. The, the wage gap is like really, really crazy. So even though we have uh, statistically uh, a higher uh, income than a lot of other countries, uh, one, we don't have any kind of support system. So things like, uh, you know, health care, uh, things like transportation, uh, we all have to uh, pay for uh, ourselves 100%. Uh, so, you know, very little, if any, paid time off. Uh, from work, very little, if any, uh, support uh, in any sort of food and any sort of infrastructure. Um, so that that's a huge issue. Uh, on top of that, uh, the um, the difference between how much you make versus how much your boss can make uh, can be staggering. So, um, you know, I, I see people here jumping into the comments saying like Joseph Pina saying socialism works and Nate saying it doesn't. Um, I I think that there are right and wrong ways to implement socialism, uh, but that all being the case and separating kind of from that for the moment, um, it, uh, if you're saying that socialism doesn't work, you can also say pretty, pretty clearly that uh, capitalism hurts people in a lot of ways uh, and, and doesn't work for the individual. Uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of a, a thing to go back and forth on, but we have other videos talking about that too. Francisco says, this is still a little too late because if you have to go buy, buy basic stuff, you'll have to give 5,000 dinars. And if you have to pay bills that are around 50, 15,000 dinars, then you're already out of money. Absolutely. Um, Richard says, yeah, minimum wage um, gets you maybe $1,000 a month, roughly, depending on what state you have. So in like 
New York or California, it would be high since minimum wage is 15, the other states it's 10. Um, agreed. But uh, it, again, it, it ends up in a weird situation where you have uh, these rapidly different minimum wages and also rapidly different like cost of housing. Uh, there are plenty of people in California who make well above their state's minimum wage, you know, people who make uh, 20 to $25 an hour who are still homeless, like who, who cannot afford a home in California because uh, you know, rent prices are incredibly high and owning a home is virtually impossible if you hadn't purchased one uh, a significant time back and have enough income to uh, really, really uh, be comfortable. Anybody uh, who is anywhere close to, you know, the, um, the minimum wage in California trying to find uh, consistent housing is struggling right now uh, and has been for quite a while. Uh, it's, there is a rampant homeless crisis in um, in uh, states like California and in states like Alabama, we say, oh, well, there's, you know, there's not nearly as much homelessness here, so we must be doing the right thing. You know, our, our, uh, uh, our, uh, 725 an hour minimum wage is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is great. You know, uh, this is, this working so well. Uh, the cost of living is significantly lower in Alabama, but as well, uh, there's this huge issue that, uh, you know, there aren't very many urban areas in Alabama. So the homeless people in Alabama are just suffering because they're, you know, out in the middle of nowhere with no support uh, or having to stay in these densely, uh, these, these urban areas, which mainly support uh, large scale transportation like highway systems and not, you know, closely connected, uh, high density populations. Tiffany's up, uh, and we have some stuff to do, so I am going to head out, guys. But I do appreciate everybody hanging out. Um, I'll read the last one's comments real quick, and then we will head out. Retro said, I never understood why Yugoslavia broke up. I'm sure it was for the better. Um, I wish I knew more about history so I could inform you, uh, and so that I could learn more myself, I guess. Francisco said, 1 million Serbs dead, 6,000 uh, dead Croats, uh, 15,000 dead Slovenians, 200,000 dead Germans. Uh, yep, got them. Uh, this is horrible, horrible. War is absolutely rough. Uh, Nate says, independent nationalist groups rose up and took it down. Uh, makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely appreciate everybody uh, chiming in and supporting the stream today. Uh, I know this has been a stream that's, again, talked about a lot of different issues, but I really do want to hit on the fact that I brought up in the main part of the stream, the early part of the stream, which is that micronations need to understand how to market themselves. They need to understand what it is that our community is seen as from the outside versus the way that we see ourselves. This is something that is tough. This is something that, again, I, you know, a lot of people in the comments here are, are talking about other things. And I certainly respect the other conversations that we're having. But I think it's because we, we have very little to say on this topic, which is, Go out and, and talk to people and learn about what they think of you developing a micronation and what it is that they see you doing and why it is that they either support or do not support uh, what you're doing. Retro says, should I stream again tomorrow? Absolutely, Retro. I would love for you to stream whenever it is that you would like to. Uh, it means a lot and it's legitimately a huge amount of support for us. So yes, if you would like to stream tomorrow, that would be an incredible help to us. Uh, if you want to stream tonight as well, you're, you're more than welcome to. Whenever you have time and are available and are comfortable doing it, uh, please, uh, whenever you whenever you want to. Um, I, I would love to set that up. Just let me know, um, and that way I can go ahead and set up the thumbnail and stuff like that and go ahead and send that to you. Um, but yeah, I appreciate it. I uh, hope everybody has a good afternoon. Um, I can't wait to continue to talk to you all and to continue to boost these watch time hours up, get closer to 4,000, uh, and hopefully continue to expand the great empire that is Eternia. Thank you all so much, and until next time, Eternia forever. Eternia forever, Vincent. Have a good night, everybody. A good afternoon. Peace, guys.